we must remove the plank from our own eye before we seek, seek to remove the splinter from someone else's. Ben Stone, also known as the Bad Quaker, has a podcast and a website, badquaker.com, where you can go and learn all about this. But today, we have the pleasure of having him here to speak with us. With no further ado, Ben Stone. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for enduring the heat to come out here. Um, although, for some areas of the country, this is not really considered heat. This is nice and cool. If you've listened to my talks before, you'll know that I never use notes. I, well, I often make notes. I sometimes even read the title of the notes, and it rarely gets past that. I just start rambling, and then about like 40, 45 minutes into the talk, I try to remember what I've been talking about and then wrap it all up somehow. Uh, it's going to be my attempt today to not do that. I, I asked myself early, uh, early this week, and I don't mean this to sound gloomy or whatever, it's not a prediction of the future or whatever, but I thought, you know, if I only can say one thing, if I can only get one thought across, if this is the only chance that I have, what will I say? And so I abandoned my notes, and I actually made notes that I'm going to attempt to use. Discovering and defeating statist thinking. And I want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. First off, if you haven't read Larkin Rose's book, uh, The Most Dangerous Superstition, I want to really urge you to get your hands on either the electronic version or the print version or steal it if you need to or do whatever you need to do to get your hands on Larkin's book. Aha! We have sound. Do whatever you have to do within the zero aggression principle to get your hands on Larkin Rose's book. I said steal. If you're going to steal it, steal it from like a government individual. A library is a great place to steal things from. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so the most dangerous superstition, uh, under reading and understanding Larkin's position in that book will help make what I'm going to say make sense. Um, also, you know, I'm going to, if you're not particularly religious, if you're atheist, if you're, uh, you know, whatever particular position you are with theism or atheism or whatever, I'm going to mention a couple things from the Bible, but uh, it's not necessary that you be a Christian or it's not necessary that you believe even one word of the Bible to still be able to take a really old story and go, hey, there's something in there I can get. So I'm not trying to convince anybody to take on any particular religion position. As a matter of fact, it's going to be my goal today to show you that there is a religion and that the most critical thing that humani humanity can do is reject that religion, and that religion is statism. Thank you. So I want to paint a picture of something just to kind of put some foundation for what I'm talking about. Let's say you've got this guy, and he's, uh, it's thousands of years ago, and he's sitting beside a riverbank, and he's sitting in the shade, and maybe he's eating a fig, right? Okay, so he's sitting here, and he's looking across this valley, and he's seeing uh, farms and farmers working their fields. And he's looking at that, and he gazes the other direction, and he sees soldiers practicing in a field. And he looks further in another direction, and he sees a bureaucrat with a farmer counting sheep, probably for taxation reasons. And he looks further, and he sees the town surrounding a mound in the distance. And on that mound is a stronghold. And he thinks of all the people in that little town, the baker, the, you know, the butcher, all those people in the town that support this community, that work with the farmers, and all of that that goes to maintain that tiny little group of people in that stronghold. And as he's sitting under this tree, relaxing, it dawns on him what he's really looking at. Not just the physical aspects of what he's looking at, but the deeper processes of how this functions and how it works. And he looks at this, and a concept pops into his head, and he realizes he sees something that nobody else has talked about openly. 
And so he simply thinks to himself, what would it be like if what's happening in this valley catches on and other places do the same thing? And what would happen if these get large enough that these little strongholds become whole unions of strongholds and it becomes a network of these things like this that I'm seeing? <clears throat> now, at some point, he follows this through in his mind and he says, you know, you could have this tiny little setting that we have here that could go out over great distances, could take up whole continents, far beyond what he, the, the, the distances that he could imagine, maybe even take over the whole world with something like this pattern that I see here, with people working and with soldiers doing what they do and merchants and skilled craftsmen doing what they do and a hierarchy living in a citadel demanding that all of that wealth or at least a good portion of it goes to them this concept he rolls around in his mind and he says what would it be like if everybody did this now this is not necessarily a guy having some kind of deity whisper in his ear and tell him what the future is going to be like it's it's just a guy thinking to himself logically where does this thing take us? Where does it go? And let's say it dawns on him that if that this is really bad. This is really bad to have all these people essentially slaves to those guys in that little citadel up there and those soldiers enforcing it upon all of us. And occasionally these soldiers go out and raid other areas and bring back wealth. But it's all within the same thing. What would it be like if everybody did this? And he realizes how evil this is for those guys in that little citadel to lord over everyone and to take from them the, the sweat of their brow. And so he thinks ahead and he realizes what the future holds if this catches on. But the problem is he can't go tell the farmer about his thoughts because the farmer is going to be so offended by realizing that he's a slave that he's probably going to try to stone him or kill him. And he can't go tell the soldiers because they have a vested interest in not letting this secret get out. They'll just run him through with a spear. And he can't tell the bureaucrat because the bureaucrat will tell the soldiers and the soldiers will ram him through with a spear because the bureaucrat doesn't have the guts to do it himself. And he can't tell the people in the town because they're just slaves exactly like the farmer and they don't want to hear it. They're living in peace and they just don't want to hear that they're actually slaves. And he certainly doesn't want to let the king know in the citadel, because again, the king doesn't have the guts to do it himself. But the king will have those soldiers run him through with spears, or worse, he'll torture him for enjoyment before he does it. So what's he going to do? Well, one of the things he can do is he can, let's say he's more of a storyteller around the town than anything else. So he can formulate this idea that he has in the form of a story depicting what the future could be like under the horrible circumstances where a tyranny goes worldwide. And he can tell the story. But let's say he's not a storyteller. Let's say he's more of the preacher type, you know, yelling and, and doing that whole show like that. Well, he can proclaim himself a prophet, and he can say that God has told him this, and he's got a vision of the future and it's a, it's a horrible, horrible thing in the future that's going to come. And there's going to be struggles and all these things. Well, when I, when I talk about the Bible in this, in this conversation, if you don't particularly believe in the Bible, that's all right. Think of it maybe as people maybe washed by a lot of other things too. Maybe there's a lot of other confusion and noise in this book. But what if there's one or two or three stories in there there were just guys sitting around going, you know what? What if this catches on? What's things going to be like? What's the world going to look like? Well, within that book, there's a couple of people who paint a picture uh, of the future that looks pretty grim, except it looks exactly what's coming at us. Now, people in the past have made a lot of money off of those guys' predictions. That's not the purpose here. Uh, let me get back to my notes, because I've already violated what I promised I would do. 
Okay, so now let me break away from that and talk about two words, government and state. And if you're a regular listener of mine or if you've heard my talks before, I often talk about the distinction between government and state. And this is because, for lack of a better word in English, I'm stuck using these two words. I would like to use a different word, but I just don't have a lot of options. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien is mostly known for uh, what did uh, Penn Jillette said that he writes about uh, hippies and midgets. And, and that's, you know, Penn tends to be offensive. So that's, that's Penn Jillette's way of saying things in as offensive a way possible and still getting a point across. But, um, but that's a tiny aspect of what Tolkien was. Tolkien was, I'll get it correctly here by reading it, Tolkien was the professor of Anglo-Saxon, the professor of English language at Oxford University, and he was the greatest... Philosist? Philosist? It's a, uh, it's a person who uh, is an expert in the study of language in written historical sources. And he was quite possibly, I mean, if you really examine the guy's life, he should be considered in there with Mises and Einstein and several other people of that level. He was a very intelligent person. And, um, and he told us to never capitalize the G in government. Never make a person out of government. Tolkien was an anarchist, a political anarchist. And, if, and he felt like if you can't have anarchy, the next best thing is to have a king with, uh, with no constitution. Why is that? Because if he acts up, you can just kill him. Not a problem. And that's actually the traditional thing in, you know, in the olden days, like, like the, the time frame that Tolkien studied. When the king acted up, if he, if he couldn't be controlled any other way, you just kill him, get a new one. So maybe that's a, not quite as good as anarchy, but certainly better than any other system. So, so if we can't capitalize, if the guy who knows maybe more about the English language than anybody else ever, if he says you can't capitalize the G in government and personalize it, then I'm not going to capitalize the G in government and personalize it. So, so I define government. Let me be careful here. Uh, each government is a collective made up of individual people who have been given special privileges and special authority to act in ways no one outside of government may act. These individuals act together to maintain a monopoly of authority within a geographic boundary agreed upon by like-minded individuals in other governments. So in other words, they're special. They think they're special. Largely, people think they're special. We give them rights and privileges nobody else has. And they maintain that. Well, I'll get into that in a second. Um, and they work with people in other governments to divide up the earth and decide which monopolies control which areas. Now, there's two physical ways that government maintains their control. Uh, they use brute force or the threat of brute force. And they use wealth taken from some, distributed to others, for the purpose of appeasement. Now, these are the two physical ways that government stays, all governments stay in power throughout history. But governments require more than physical violence and theft to stay in power. They require the ability to convince people to let them do this. And that's where I separate from Tolkien's government with a little g. All those people who do this to us are government with a little g. But the way that they do it and convince us not to rise up and kill the king is through what I call the state. Now, if you actually go into the word, the state uh, in English goes back to uh, the word condition, like condition. What is the state of something? What is the condition of something? So I think that's more appropriate to use uh, to use the word state, and I capitalize it when I'm referring to this myth of statism, this, this religion, this idea that somehow one small group of people have the right to dominate everybody else, take from our labor, tell us what is and isn't law, and punish us if they feel like it. So I have these two things. Government is the actual people who wear funny costumes, they like to give themselves titles, 
they like to be chauffeured around and they like a lot of a lot of noise to be made about their presence and state is the religion that people believe that justifies having those guys in government and if you're a regular listener you've heard all that like a, a thousand times maybe now I want to jump backwards in time real quick to the origin of the state and there's a little controversy about this people like Hobbes have given us a lie a very convenient lie for 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 the governments and for um, for the state uh, and I reject all of Hobbes teaching on the origin of government the problem is and I'm not going to honor him by even mentioning it today you can look it up for yourself in Wikipedia but the, but the problem is a lot of libertarians, a lot of anarchists, and a lot of humans in general, in one form or another, believe Hobbes' lies. So it pollutes, even though, even though it's been uh, very well debunked, Hobbes' lies were very well debunked, it still goes through humanity. We still believe this idea that without government, without the authority, without a cop right here keeping me from doing it, I would be robbing you people. I would be, oh no, we don't think of it like that. We think of it the other way around. If the cop wasn't here protecting me, you guys would want to rob me. That's the thought process. Well, that's ridiculous. It doesn't happen. You know what? I've got like a $200 microphone that sat out for days at my camp here since I've been here. Nobody, I don't think anybody would touch it. Why would they? Because people are not good, but they tend to behave themselves. They, generally speaking, they tend to get along. They can't tend to behave themselves. So I don't. I totally reject Hobbes' ideas about man. Just well, I wasn't going to say it, but he, he, Hobbes draws a picture of man being this just angry, you know, dragging his knuckles around looking for who he can rob and rape next. I mean, that's what Hobbes draws for us as a picture of humanity. I reject it. I've never seen it anywhere. I have been in lots of places. I've been around bikers where, you know, there's literally hundreds of guys there. And the only law is what they feel in here. And no one is aggressed upon. And it's not just because, you know, it can't be because they're all so bad that nobody would mess with them. There's got to be some in there that are, that are tougher than others. And yet, they get along and they don't steal from each other. Now, if Hobbes was right, that couldn't exist. Because here's what are considered, you know, oftentimes, some of the worst people in society, these horrible, horrible bikers, and they don't rob from each other. They don't steal from each other. They honor each other. They actually speak to each other with respect. Because that's what humans do. Okay, so um, I deviated again. Somewhere around 9 to 7,000 B.C., there was a valley, very much like I described earlier. And there had been, for several thousand years, people farming in that valley. And then something happened. There was a mound in one end of that valley, and it was a rocky outcropping there. And a group of people, most likely men, probably about 25 to 30, decided to build a fortification there. They built a wall and they built a, a tower, what we would consider a small tower, but for its day it was a pretty good structure. It was not a big enough fortification to hold more than maybe 25 or 30, maybe if you squeeze it up to 50, but you have to assume they had no horses or anything to protect if you take that number up to 50. If you take the number down to about 20, then you have enough room in this little, in this little castle for about 20 people and their horses or camels if you prefer, but there's actually evidence that camels hadn't been domesticated quite yet. But anyway, there's just enough room in there for them. So that means this castle is not created to protect the valley. It's not created to protect the commoners, the workers, the slaves. It's meant to protect a small elite, uh, elite little group. Now the problem is there's no more city-state. This is the first city-state that we know of through archaeology. It is the first physical evidence of the existence of the state. And that was in, at, the, at the Mound of Jericho. This is the very first one we know of. Now, the next one didn't appear 
for another 2,000 years, and it was a pretty good distance away at the, in the Tigris and Euphrates River down way in the far end of it. So it wasn't a threat to this mound, and this mound had no exterior threat. There was no other city-state that might come and attack it. So what did they need fortification against? What did this little group of 25 to 50 people, what were they afraid of? What did they need to protect themselves from? Well, the only logical answer to that is that they needed to protect themselves from the people they were robbing, from the people that fed them, the farmers and the merchants in that valley. That's who they were afraid of, and that's who they fortified themselves for, against for 2,000 years before anybody else built another citadel. So for that reason, they built what, as best we can tell, the first state in Jericho. Now, like I said, it takes a little bit more than brute force, and it takes a little bit more than bribery. It takes a myth. It takes an idea. And they had it at Jericho. They had a god named Tammuz, and he was a hero god. Now, he, w he didn't start out being a hero god. He started out being a shepherd god. But the story was perverted, and he became a, a hero god that gave his life for Jericho. And the really great part about it was everything that those guys in that citadel then did was in the name of Tammuz because Tammuz was this great hero god that saved them from whatever the myths made up and they needed to be saved from. And they were actually, the story is very much like Hercules and, and there's a bunch of Osiris, Nimrod. The same myth is given a whole lot of different names. But essentially, you have this hero god saving the people. And so by that, by the fact that he is, first off, he's, he's not the original god. He's, I'm sorry, he's the son of God. He's a half god. He's a son of God. And he is this hero god who saves them from all this terrible stuff. And through that authority, those priests, those magic men in that citadel, that king, have the authority to rule over the valley because they're protecting you. They're serving you. And this myth caught on. And it caught on all around the eastern Mediterranean, eventually to the Indus River, and all the way to China. It caught on in Egypt. Uh, and like I said, the gods were called Tammuz, Nimrod, Osiris, Hercules, Heracles, uh, Adonis, Baal, or Baal. And the cities that we know of that were formed using this specific theology include Summer, well, uh, uh, Jericho, I mentioned, Summer, Ur, Babylon, Nineveh, Lesbos, Sparta, and the list just goes on. All of them have this myth as their origin. And these little city-states grew and grew and grew. Now that's the origin of the state. And the state died several times, disappeared completely. All the rest of the globe had people living, trading. There was a, a healthy, um, what's that, uh, not onyx, uh, uh, obsidian. There was a healthy obsidian trade that, that, that ringed through the whole area long before there was a state. So we know that there were trading routes, there was metallurgy, there was money, there was farming, there was all the things that we need. There was art, there was all the things we need for civilization, but there was no state until it was invented on that mound. And then it caught on like a virus. And that was 7,000 B.C., 9,000 to 12,000 years ago. That's how old this religion of the state is, 9 to 12,000 years. How old is humanity? Well, some theologians will tell us only 5,000 years. Well, that, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that number. There's a lot of science that show us that humanity as we know it, civilization, uh, building of houses, farming, activity, hunter-gatherer activity, goes back at least 50,000 years, and humanity may be vastly older than that. Humanity like we know it now, that is. Not, you know, not modern computers and cities and things like that. But what makes us human is very old. Now, shifting gears again, I've got a little question. And play with this in your mind. And all of us that are 
kind of wandered in and out of the survivalist community have played this thought process over and over and over. What happens? What would, the, what would it be like if something were to happen, let's say a virus were to get out of control, some, some weird thing was to happen, and 75, 80% of the human population were to die within, let's say, a year? What, 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 would be, what would life be like for the remainder of humanity? How long would it take for humanity to get back technologically to where we're starting to think of our past and think about what things were like in the past? So let's just imagine this, that something horrible happens. Humanity almost disappears from existence. There's a small pocket of humans that, that survive. 10,000 years go by, and finally, humans have gained enough population back and enough wealth back that they're starting to say, what were things like in the olden days? And so they start digging, and they dig in a place like Washington, D.C. And they, they find statues, and they find columns, and they find all these relics from, from 10,000 years ago. What, did, what were they thinking? What were these Americans? What were they? What did they believe? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what they would believe. They would believe... That, there was, that the Americans, these Americans, believed in a religion, and it had a father god, and his name was George Washington. And it had a hero god, and that hero god's name was Abraham Lincoln. And, and this is absolutely what they would find. Because what do they see? They see an obelisk, they see a phallic symbol with the, with the father god raised to the sky for the Father God. That's what they would find. And they would find the hero God seated in, Sa in, in not Saturn's temple, Jupiter's temple. There's the hero God with his oversized hands touching the fascists on each side, sitting in his throne. The great supreme hero God, the Thor of this civilization. There he is, Adonis. Well, not quite Adonis. Adonis was kind of a sexy guy. He was more, you know, but... But he was, still the, he was still the hero god. So, so there's Lincoln, the great hero god that saved the, saved the Union. He freed the slaves. He did all these wonderful things. There's no notation there that he's personally responsible for the deaths, deaths of more Americans than any other individual. That's not listed. But he's the hero god. And, and Washington is the father god. And if you doubt that, they find a mountain with the faces of these people carved into the living rock, with, with the Father God Washington's face out there, right? And, and those lesser gods who supported him, and there's Lincoln off to the side, gazing at him, because Lincoln saved him, see? That's part of the religion. And there it is. And is it so different? Is what we're finding when we when we dig up ancient civilizations and we say, oh, well, this is their religion and that's their religion and this is why they, they built this story. Well, what would they think when they'd find the remnants of Hoover Dam? They're going to find that. And let's just say for the sake of our little conversation, let's say they've already figured out the watering problem or let's say the weather has changed and watering is not a problem. So they have absolutely no reason to make a dam. So what are they going to think when they find Hoover Dam? And they start to examine it, and they start to find bodies embedded into the concrete, and there are. What are they going to think when they find that? What are they going to think when they, when they dissect those bodies and they find out that some of them were alive when they were buried in that concrete? And they were. Human sacrifice was a part of this religion. And then they start to look. Of course, there's no books left, but they're going to find out what happened in the 20th century. And what happened in the 20th century? I'm going to jump ahead slightly because this is really important. And if I don't get to anything else, I have to get to this. What happened in the 20th century? Well, among humanity, and this changes from culture to culture, and you know, different people are different, about four, excuse me, there's about four murders for every 100,000 people. We're not all that nice sometimes. So whether we're talking about uh, an angry husband and a cheating wife or an angry wife and a cheating husband 
or a burglar that slips into the house in the middle of the night and somebody's defending their house or whatever. About four per year, about four out of 100,000, there's some kind of killing. Civilian, let's say, let's put it that way, civilian killing. Four in 100,000. That means, doing the basic math, in the 20th century, there were about 280,000 murders, 280,000 times that a private citizen killed another private citizen for whatever reason. Now, I don't have to even go any further with the math. If you just think about that, 200, 280,000 killings, murders, privately. It's the one thing that we can't do privately that government does with blazing efficiency. Because what is the government's record in the 20th century? Well, the state slaughtered 262 million people by democide alone. That's non-war. That's uh, ethnic cleansing. That's, uh, you know, all the things. That's, that's droning uh, a wedding party with people because there might be a bad guy in there. That's just in the 20th century. And we didn't even have dro droning back then. You know, we had to rely on dumb bombs and things. So I don't know what it's going to be like in this century. Yeah. Um, so the state killed 262 million people by democide in the 20th century and another 160 million through war. So that's uh, private numbers here. Uh, there's 280,000 people killed by people. But the sacrifice to the state equals 422 million. 422 million in 100 years, and you multiply that back to the 10 to 12,000 years the earth ha that the state has existed. And this has been the history of the state right along. In the 20th century, the state was able to have that many people sacrificed to it because it had uh, more modern weapons, and it could do that with more efficiency. But this has always been the tendency of the state. The state was just limited on how fast and how horrible it could kill people up until the 20th century. And if we think about the state projected just like that guy on the bank did, and we project it ahead, and we think of the technological changes that are taking place, what is going to be the capability of people to sacrifice to their god, the state? What is going to be the capability in another 50 or 100 or 200 years? How how horribly will we, all of us, sacrifice life to this God, the state? Let me jump back slightly. And I have a note here that tells me, stay on target. It's in bold caps with exclamation points. Yeah, you know. Okay, now the state has gone through specific stages since those days where it was Tamils and the mound at Jericho. The state has gone through specific changes. Stages, rather. There was the hero god that I described earlier. The state was based on a hero god. The authority of the government came from its descendants from this hero god. But, you know... Lies get old after a while, and that lie got old, and it had to be adapted. The state was about to vanish, and so we have. No longer was it the hero god, it was the descendants of the hero god. So, so those guys up there are maybe six or eight generations away from the hero god, or 20 generations away, but they're still in the line of the hero god. So that's where they get their legitimacy. These are pharaohs and kings, that kind of thing. But... Humans got tired of pharaohs and kings, and the lie got thinner and thinner each time it was told. So then we have to go with uh, the representative God. He is not the descendant of the God, but we know that he's selected by the God because he's a champion. He's a conqueror. He's a great general. He's, uh, what else did I give him? Yeah, an emperor. He has got to where he has got because he is a great man. And he may not be directly descended from the God. As a matter of fact, we may, have, we may have slipped in our mind and not even so much believe in the same God. But this great man, this man, magnificent emperor, is who he is because, because God or the gods or something that's beyond humanity 
has blessed him with capabilities that none of the rest of us has. He is the great man, and therefore he deserves to be emperor. And then we have the, the next manifestation of this, because that gets thin after a while. So the next manifestation is, okay, well, let's re-examine this God idea. And we start to, in history, we start to place humanity in the position of God. And we start to say, you know what? People should be able to choose who that leader is. Democracy is born. Now, of course, it was born a long time ago, but like any idea, it catches on slowly. And eventually, we reject the king. We reject the emperor. We reject the great general. And we reject all of these ideas. And we think that, really, humanity is God. And if we all vote together, then the guy who wins the election, that's the great man, and God has chosen him. You see? You see the leap there? Humanity has become God. We don't need Tamils. We are Tamils. But only collectively, not individually. None of you individually matter. It's only the God, democracy, that matters. And that God chooses our new leader, our great man. Now again, this doesn't take prophecy. This takes a logical progression from one thing to the next for the guy on the bank of the river to see it coming. It's not magic. You don't have to believe, you don't have to have faith in any book or anything else to realize that this was entirely predictable. And that's not taking away. If you believe the Bible, that's great. I'm not trying to tell you don't believe the Bible. I've read through it several times and I actually enjoy reading it. But even without believing in a Bible, this is a logical projection that anybody who could have seen what anybody who understands human nature and caught a glimpse of what that thing was back in Jericho with a little thought, they could put it worldwide in their mind and they could say, yeah, this is going to happen. It's going to eventually get, and if this is good, if government's good, if you believe government is good, if you believe that this process is good, then you also have to believe, I mean, it's just logic, you have to believe that less governments, singular, more powerful governments, are better than a lot of unpowerful, less powerful governments. The more centralized and the more powerful the central government is, the better it is. It, you only think that if you follow through logically. Now, you can, you can deceive yourself and you can say, well, if we have thousands and thousands of weak governments, we'll be fine. We were there, and that's how it brought us to here. So the facts prove you wrong. Tiny little governments produce bigger governments, which produce bigger governments, which produce bigger governments. And either way, the logical, pres pres the logical progression of this is one government. If, if a government is good, and if a government is a good idea, and if government is justified, and if the myth of the state is real, and if the state is God, then we need one government worldwide, one government to rule all of mankind. And it needs a head. It needs a single hero. It needs... Uh, an individual, one personality. Now this is just logic and it's not prophecy. I have no particular ability to prophesy. But I'm telling you what the future is bringing. Now Mises thoroughly debunked socialism. Some people don't believe that. That's okay. Mises thoroughly debunked socialism. And yet, people believe socialism. Every government in the world is based on socialism. So even though Mises took facts and debunked socialism, socialism still the rule of the day. Um, Herbert Spencer debunked the great man theory. He carefully and thoroughly debunked the great man theory. And it doesn't matter. You still see crowds of people in total adoration of the current Adonis of Barack Obama. They bow before him like he's a god. And not just him. I'm not just picking on him. The previous god before him was the same way. There were people just totally engulfed in worshiping George W. Bush. So we still have the gods. Even though Spencer totally debunked the great man theory, it's still common. It's still believed. I'm sorry, but if Ron Paul had been elected, 
He fits the category. I, I voted for Ron Paul in 1988. I voted for him in 2008. But to believe that Ron Paul is going to magically take government and fix it and make it all good is the great man theory. It's still worshiping this religion. I'm sorry, but that's just the fact. Now that I have offended people, and I know I have, at least on YouTube, <laughs> this is all predictable without, the, the, without prophecy. It's predictable. It's logic. Now I want to tell you about the temptation of Christ. I have 18 minutes left. The Temptation of Christ. Not the movie. Um, cr according to the story, and I'm not saying the story is true. I tend to believe it, but you don't have to. You can think it's entirely made up. You can think a guy sitting on a creek bank or a river bank made this whole story up. Perfectly comfortable with that because it will still work for my point. So Christ is taken up to this high point, this position where he can see all through. And he's shown, the tempter is with him, and the tempter is showing him all the great governments of the world, the kingdoms, the, uh, you know, the empires, the democracies, the republics. Christ is shown all these things through time. And the tempter says, you know what? I own this. This is my realm it's been given to me, and it's mine. And I can give it to you. And Christ says, no, I'm not going to. And so some other things happen, and the government kills him. That's basically the story. Now, if you believe that he was tempted, then you have to believe that the, tempta that the temptation was valid. In other words, if I've got a guy, well, let's put it this way. It would be better to put it this way. Let's say I'm trying to not really diet, but I'm trying to lose some weight, right? And there's a guy standing next to me, and he says, you know what would be good? A donut. Would you like a donut? Yeah, I'd like a donut. But if I know this guy has no access to a donut, I'm not tempted. If we're in the middle of the desert, and there's no donuts within 500 miles, and the dude's like, hey, wouldn't you like a donut? It wouldn't be a temptation, because I know he has no capability to give me a donut. So if Christ was tempted, if the story has any validity at all, even as a moral story, even if it's just made up by a guy on a creek bank, for the story to have any validity, the tempter did have ownership of all the governments of the world and the concept of government in every kingdom and every empire. It's all the realm of the tempter. The state... Let's put it this way. Christ rejected that because Christ is anti-state. Christ was anti-state. Thank you. Now, if you believe that, if you believe that Christ was anti-state, then what is anti-Christ? Yeah. Yeah. It's only logic. Okay. So, if it was a viable offer, offer, I don't know. If it was a viable offer, then the realm of the state is the realm of Satan. And belief in the state, the faith in the state, the religion of the state is the true religion of Satan. Now, we don't need a guy with funny horns and hoof and feet carrying a hay fork with a bifurcated tail, vifur vi a split tail. <laughs> Thank you. We don't need that because we have fields in Cambodia full of dried skulls to prove that he exists. And we have fields in Ukraine. And we have fields in Germany. And we have fields all over this planet of the dead bodies that were sacrificed to this hideous God. I was going to go into the fall. I was going to go into the, the, fall, uh, the fall of Satan that's de de that is depicted in the, in the Bible, and I was going to compare that to what the Bible says about the fall of man. 
Uh, I've rambled on and ran out of, haven't ran out of time, but I'm getting a little tight, and I don't have time to go into those two stories. But if you look at the story that's in the Bible that describes the fall of Satan, and you just take out everything you've been taught about Satan and throw it away, and then you go and you read the story in Genesis about the fall of man, you'll see it's the same story. It's the desire of man to replace natural law, to replace the law that is natural to human beings that we function under every single day, to decide in our minds to take that law, reject it, and set up human beings to create our new laws, to create and enforce laws based on their opinions, not based on what is natural to us. I talk on my podcast all the time about things like squirrels and birds and things like this because I spend way too much time watching animals of different kinds. And each animal behaves according to its species. So, for instance, you never see squirrels. You never see like 50 or 75 squirrels in a yard running across the yard and then suddenly all at once changing direction, going the other direction across the yard. They don't do that. You'll never see cats do that. You will never see 50 cats get together and all run in the same direction and then suddenly change directions and go in the other way. Yet fish do that all the time. Some fish, not all fish. You never see sharks doing that. But some animals, you see, you see um, uh, blackbirds, uh, um, specifically like starlings. You see starlings do this all the time. You see red wings do this. You see uh, a lot of different species of birds that do that. But eagles don't do that. Hawks don't do that. And it's not just predators, because, uh, you know, there's some, pretty much all birds are predators. They're opportunists, but they'll kill and pretty much eat anything they can get their little beak on, mostly. So it's not a, a difference between predator and non-predator. It's a difference between the nature of the species. So just like you never see squirrels herding like that, there are tendencies that are that are natural to human beings. There are ways that we tend to behave. Now, if you take an animal, any particular animal, and you shove him into an unnatural setting, if he can survive that, he will adapt to that unnatural setting. So, for example, uh, if you have, well, where I live, we have uh, a lot of robins, and we have very regulated yards. Everybody has their own yard with their own little fence and their own little plot of, of stinking grass. I hate grass. Anyway, and robins, because you can't, I can't eat grass. What am I growing grass for? But anyway, so, so robins will divide up territories where I live into yards, and each robin will guard and harvest from one yard. But last winter, I spent the winter in southern Alabama, and there's a lot of forests and a lot of not yards where we were at. And the robins flocked. Robins flocked like other birds because they were in a natural setting. In our yards in Ohio, where I live, was not the natural setting of robins, but they adapted to that. They live the best they can according to the situation that they're dealing with. Now humans, for a few thousand years, and mostly for the last 150 years, have lived under the thumb of the state. Prior to the last 150 years, most humans lived outside of state control. Most humans lived not in areas where the state could seriously affect them. But in the last 100 to 150 years, more and more humans, almost all humans now, are under the fist of government somehow. And so we adapt, and we attempt to survive, and we devour each other, and we rob from each other, and we steal from each other, and we depend upon each other in ways that are unhuman, inhumane and unhuman. They're both horrible and they're beautiful in ways that we can adapt and help each other, even given the fact that we are under this kind of oppression, oppression that we lie to ourselves about regularly and tell ourselves, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. I'm not a slave. I'm just doing my little farm. It's okay if they take 10%. As long as they don't take 15, I'll be good. Okay, now they're taking 15. Well, as long as they don't take 20. You know, it's better than that other, that other valley over there where the tyrant takes 19%. I'm only at 15% here. It's much better, though. Those poor people over there, I don't know why they don't rebel. I went off my topic so far, so long, <laughs> that the Kindle went to... Yeah. Okay. 
I think I made the point I was chasing there anyway. Okay, so let me take it back to my notes a little bit. So I've, I've made the statement that Christ rejected the state, Christ is anti-state, and the state is anti-Christ. And that it is this religion, I'm recapping now, by the way. So it is this religion, and it's a horrible religion that demands human sacrifice. Think about that. In the future, when the state is gone, and people are telling tales of what used to be, they will look at our generations, and they will say, those barbarians sacrificed people, sacrificed humans to their God. However you may think back on some previous civilization that we know sacrificed humans, it's happening today. It's just that God has a different name. Actually, it's the same God. Um, so then, how can we discover status thinking? And the key uh, in, my, in my little teaser for this talk was discovering status thinking and removing the plank from our own eye before we pick on the splinter that's in somebody else's eye. How do we do that? We examine ourselves as often as possible and ask ourselves, are, are our actions verifying the validity of, this, of the government, of this religion, the state? Or what we are doing, does it actually does it help government? Does it depend on government? Does it support government? Does it in any way make government legitimate? Is there anything that we're doing? And thoroughly ask ourselves with each thing that we do. And before we can say, you know, that stinking cop over there is this and this and this, or that stupid judge that always does this or that, or that dirty politician, think about it for yourself. What is our thought process when it comes to this, this beast, this state, this concept, this religion? Are we, um, are we working to shrink government, make it more tolerable, make it so that it doesn't hurt us quite as much? What's the ultimate goal in doing that? Well, it's to make it more comfortable on us, right? What are you doing to your children? What are you doing to your grandchildren? What are you doing to humanity? When you shrink government and make it tolerable, what are you passing on to future generations? From a purely Randian point of view, you can say, you know what? Doesn't matter about future generations. I'm the one that's important. I should take care of me. If I can get government smaller, I'll have smaller amounts of taxes to pay. I'll have less regulation. I'll live a better life. Shrinking government is good. But what are you pushing off on your family? What are you pushing off on your descendants? What are you pushing off on humanity? What you're doing is you're delaying the death of the state. You're delaying the... The, the, the crushing of this ridiculous religion, you're putting it off to another generation. And as you do that, thank you. As you do that, technology changes. And no longer is the state limited to slaughtering with the sword. Now he's got the gun. And then he's got repeating guns. And then he's got high explosives. And then he's got radiation. And then he's got smart bombs. And then he's got drone strikes. And I don't know what's coming next. Sorry. I get really angry sometimes, you know? I say this quite regularly. I hate the state. Now, that's an emotion. And you can make the argument, and it has been told to me many times, that, that hate fogs the mind. It can. It can. Hate fogs the mind. Often it does. But some of us, and it may be a, it may be a mental deficiency, but some of us, like me, can be in very, very dramatic situations that are high emotion. And when this happens with me, and I used to be on a rescue squad, and I've seen some pretty nasty things in my time, 
when really dramatic situations take place and emotions are unbelievably high, I have this tendency to just focus in like a beam on the problem and deal with it. If it's stopping bleeding, I don't care about the noise that's going on, so we're stopping the bleeding. If, there, if there's stabilizing a wound, if it's stabilizing a broken bone, if it's you know uh, supporting a machine that's about to fall and crush this person, whatever the emergency is, I set aside all the emotion and I get cold and I get hard. And uh, mm -hmm, three minutes. I have been, and, and that's not just talk, I have been in situations where a shotgun was pointed directly at my chest and the person had every intent to kill me. And my anger was beyond what words can describe. And my reaction was to very quickly snatch the shotgun out of his hands and beat him with it. And I'm not saying that because I'm like, oh, he's, you know, he's bad, he's bad. No, it's because I saw the problem and I knew that I was not going to walk away from that. I knew that he was going to pull the trigger. He absolutely was. He was about to kill me and I knew he was going to do it. And I had a tiny window of opportunity. And I took advantage of it. And it worked out. And that's not the first time, it wasn't the last time, that a gun was pulled on me in anger with the intent of killing me. So when I say I hate the state, I hate it deep in my being. And, it, and I do not allow emotion to fog my mind when I think of this. I want to do whatever it takes to kill this thing, to kill this religion, to make it so future generations have to strain themselves to understand why people believed in government. And how do we do that? Well, like I was saying, first, the very first thing we do is seek out statism in our own lives and in our own minds. Remove any dependence. Remove the idea that we can shrink government and make it tolerable. Remove the ideas in our minds that we can put up with it in any way. And I'm doing a series of podcasts right now on um, going beyond civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is critically important to our movement. Not for the purpose, though, of changing government. If you're, if you're doing civil disobedience for the purpose of changing government, guess what? You're a statist, you're a Satanist. You believe in the devil and worship him. But, but, if you're doing civil disobedience for the purpose of drawing the attention so that they can see how absurd the idea of government is, then that's positive. You're moving in the right direction. If you can do civil disobedience and, and show people how ridiculous government is, you go up and you put a quarter into a meter and government officials get mad about that because you saved somebody a fine? How absurd! And what an idea! You know? Wow! But other things too. In my podcast, I've been talking about the zero aggression principle and how all activism has to be within the realm of the zero aggression principle or non-aggression principle if you prefer. And why is that? Because if you're working outside of the zero aggression principle, you're part of the problem. Because that's what the state is. The state is the belief that activity outside of the zero aggression principle is acceptable. That doing bad can produce a good. That's the core of statism. That's the core idea in it. So activism that's within the realm of the zero aggression principle and in the few seconds I have left, let me toss out a couple just to maybe shock you a little bit. First off, what is not, what is not civil dis disobedience? Well, agorism is not civil disobedience. You don't do it for the purpose of making a point. Agorism is done for the purpose of living a life. Trading, hey, it's my right to trade this and that and this and that. So agorism is not civil disobedience. Agorism is life. A agorism is humanity. It's what we do to live and survive. It's natural. What about other things that some people might find disgusting? What about something like prostitution? Horrible, right? Maybe not. <laughs> I mean, that's your opinion, whether it is or it isn't, but it's, but it's not civil disobedience, and it's within the realm of the zero aggression principle, because really, it, you may be disgusted by it, but it's within the realm of the zero aggression principle. Therefore, 
It's, it's, uh, it's not the government's business, and it's not an attack against the government, unless you're doing it like on town square or something. Okay, so even if you're, and I'm not making any hints, by the way. Okay, so let's jump to something else. What about the destruction of property? Now, libertarians in general, and CAP specifically, we have a tendency to have a certain respect for property. But what about property that the government owns? Can the government own property? The government is a collective idea. Individuals behaving, so how can there be such a thing as government property? How can there be property when you have an organization that's based on theft and aggression and forced membership, you can't have property owned by that entity. So the governments can't actually own property. So if you destroy property that people claim belongs to the government, you may not be doing a good thing. You may be, you may be doing something that can get you beat, caged, killed, but you're not breaking the zero aggression principle. And the last thing I want to throw out here, and, and I'm putting things out just for thought. Well, no, I'll, I'll do one more. What about, uh, you know, we know hackers, the nasty, dirty hackers steal people's identities, right? We demonize them. They're almost as bad as bikers and other hippies and dirty people like that. These evil hackers are always stealing people's identities, right? Well, what if hackers are working within the zero aggression principle? What if a hacker could create a thousand usable identities? And what if there was a guy in New Hampshire that was in jail for some ridiculous thing like trading plants to another guy? And what if a couple of well-dressed well gentlemen, clean-shaven, done, you know, haircut, good-looking guys in nice suits with perfect credentials could walk up to a prison and say, we've got a transfer notice here for a, what is this guy's name? And hand the correct paperwork to the government official, and the government official releases that individual from that prison. And those guys put him into a well-marked vehicle and drive him out of state. And the next thing you know, he's in... Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, in Chile. He's sitting comfortably in Chile. And now he's got a whole new identity. And two years later, he can come back here with a clean identity and go right back to activism again. What if hackers could do that for us? What if we breed hackers, not breed like we breed cattle, but what if our community encouraged that, that type of activity to the point of where we have hackers that could provide us with pure, clean identities like that? Okay, and now the last thought. Thousand, a thousand clean identities, right? Government is bad, right? Government functions on stolen property, right? And, and shrinking government shouldn't really be our goal. But what if we had a thousand clean identities, uh, identities and all of them were drawing a thousand dollars in disability payments from Social Security per month? That would be a million dollars into the Free State Project or whatever, or into the pockets of a bunch of hackers that are doing even more like that. Million dollars a month stolen from government because they stole it to begin with. That's not a violation of the zero aggression principle. If and I'm not saying we should do this. <laughs> but if mysteriously that giant phallic symbol in Washington, D.C. were to come tumbling down in the middle of the night and not hurt anyone at all, that would not be a, viol a violation of the zero aggression principle. I wouldn't suggest it, though, because they'll still kill you. Folks, thanks a lot. I wish I had time to do a question and answer. But thank you very much. Picked up an angel whose left wing was broken I sewed him together with some string and a vision He raised his right hand and he gave me an answer 
My mouth opened wide and I asked many questions I see crowds of people all gathered around me They all want the truth but they don't want to hear it I fear they will rob me if I dare to speak it But poverty bears the fruit of the prophet And oh, I am nothing 